environmental protection. If you're not already familiar with us, I invite you to spend some time on the website at gnhra.org, where you'll find a growing research repository, community member pages containing announcements, blogs, and other items of interest to our members, a video library of some of our recent events, including last year's global series on human rights strategies in climate change litigation. And if you're not already a member, I invite you to join through the website. I'm especially thrilled today to welcome you to the first summer winter school jointly sponsored by the Global Network for Human Rights and the Environment and UN Environment or UNEP and organized by Dina Lupin Townsend, Deputy Director of the GNHRE from whom you'll hear more in a moment and Angela Kariuki, also a member of the GNHRE core team. We hope you'll sign up for many of the extraordinary courses being offered over the next few days it's a stellar lineup of some of the world's leading experts sharing their experiences and insights on a variety of cutting edge topics at the intersection of human and environmental rights. Today's program is no exception. And in fact, it's a paragon of what the GNHRE has to offer. Today, we'll be exploring the underside of participation in environmental decision-making. As you know, participation, along with access to information and access to justice when rights are violated, are the three pillars of procedural environmental rights in international, regional, and domestic constitutional law. These rights are especially important for marginalized and vulnerable groups because it is often the only way that marginalized people can tell their stories, have their voices heard, and influence decisions that impact their natural and built environments. But all too often, states fulfill their legal obligations to provide opportunities for participation in ways that are disingenuous and even corrupt. Governments are simply often not that interested in what marginalized people have to say. Marginalized they are and marginalized they are meant to remain. And yet, and yet increasingly communities are taking back their right to participation, even in the face of corrupt and illegitimate consultative practices. Today's class explores the ways in which participation can be a form of protest aimed at resisting, subverting, and replacing problematic practices rather than legitimating them. We'll be guided through these important and difficult issues by some of the most creative and trenchant speakers that I know. Dina Townsend is the Deputy Director of the GNHRE and the inspiration for the Summer Winter School and along with UNEP's Angela Kariuki, its organizer and leader. A native of South Africa, she is in the philosophy department at the University of Vienna, where she is spearheading a project on silencing and epistemic injustice in the, concept, in the context of consultation processes with indigenous peoples. Her recent book, Human Dignity and the Adjudication of Environmental Rights was published with Edward Elgart last year. Also a member of the core team of GNHRE, Rebecca Bratsby's is professor of law at the CUNY School of Law in New York, and she is the director of the CUNY Center for Urban Environmental Reform. Rebecca's research focuses on the relationship between citizens and their government, particularly the regulatory state. Her environmental justice comic books, Maya's Lot and Bina's Plant, have been used in classrooms in the United States and adopted by state environmental agencies and also made into a video. You have links for all this on the website. She currently serves on the Environmental Health Protection Advisory Committee of the American Environmental Protection Agency. It's wonderful to have you here today, Becca. Dr. Gil Dylan McGarry is an environmental educational sociologist and artist from Durban, South Africa. He's a senior researcher at the Environmental Learning Research Center at the university currently known as Rhodes. His artwork and social praxis, which is closely related to his research, is particularly focused on empathy, and he primarily works with imagination, listening, and intuition as actual sculptural materials in social settings to offer new ways to encourage personal, relational, and collective agency. It's great to have you with us today, Dylan. In addition to our principal speakers, we are joined today by two discussants. Dr. Uzwazo Etimire, 
who is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law at the University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria and the acting head of the faculty's Department of Jurisprudence and International Law. His primary research interest lies broadly in the field of environmental law and governance with a special bias for environmental, democratic, or procedural rights. And finally, Professor Elisa Morgera of the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland, specializes in international biodiversity law and its linkages with human rights, focusing on the rights of indigenous peoples and small scale fishing communities, everyone's right to health and science and business responsibility to respect human rights. She is the director of the One Ocean Hub, a global interdisciplinary research collaboration that is pioneering research on human rights and the marine environment with a view to better connecting marine and social sciences and the arts to support fair and inclusive decision-making for a healthy ocean whereby people and planet flourish. With all this incredible talent, we'd better get on our way. So Rebecca, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Thank you for organizing this, and thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, speaking to you today from traditional Lenape lands here in the state of New York. And um, as we're talking, I encourage you to check out the image on the screen. It's the cover from Venus Plant, which is book two of the Environmental Justice Chronicle that uh, Aaron mentioned. And the hyperlink is on the slide. So Venus Plant, which I'm actually not going to talk to you about today, but I'm just taking this opportunity at the beginning is a fictionalized version of a true story of how a community organized itself to force the shutdown of the Paletti power plant, which had been the single biggest polluter in New York City and had admitted more particulate matter than all other stationary sources in New York City. Um, I think it's an inspirational tale of how communities can organize themselves to effect change, so I encourage you to check it out. But I'm here to talk to you about another community-driven campaign, the Renewable Rikers Campaign, that sits at the intersection of human rights, social, racial, and environmental justice. And I just want to take a moment to emphasize how important it is that we appreciate uh, in the context of energy generation, how much of the burden of energy extraction, production, has been borne by communities of color and how little of the benefit in terms of access to energy those communities have accrued from all of that activity. So I'm going to talk in some detail about Rikers Island, which is New York City's main jail. And the introductory details may seem like they have nothing to do with the environment, but trust me, um, I hope by the end you'll see the connection. And more importantly, you'll start asking a similar set of questions about energy generation wherever uh, you are located. So if I can figure out how to advance my slide, that would be good. Yeah. Sorry, here we go. Okay. So background about Rikers Island. Rikers Island is part of the traditional ter territory of the Muncie, Lenape, Wappinger, and Matiakok tribes. And around 1654, the co Dutch colonial governor, Stuyvesant, granted the island to the von Riken family, a family that exploited enslaved labor to build a vast fortune. The family then parlayed this fortune into social and political prominence in New York over the ensuing decades. So I want to direct your attention to the man in the upper left. That's Richard Riker, uh, the von Rikens after the American Revolution. Uh, Amer I emphasize their names to Rikers. Rebecca, can yes. you please make sure that you're sharing your slides? Oh, gosh. I am so sorry. Um, maybe. I can try. Okay, can you see them now? Yes, perfect, thank okay. you. Sorry about that. Anyway, that's the, the cover I was telling you about. We'll just go on to, here's where I, we were. Um, this is um, Richard Riker, who was von Riken until he anglicized his name. Um, he was New York City's reporter, which is a municipal judge. In the decades before the Civil War, he became infamous for abusing his position as a uh, reporter to sell black New Yorkers into slavery. He and two police officers were known as the Kidnapping Club, and they uh, hustled people into Rikers Court where he denied them their rights under the Constitution to prove that they were not runaway slaves and were in fact free citizens. Um, it's a, a terrible travesty, but it was nearly invisible to white New York. To white New York, 
Recorder Riker was a saintly kind of a, a person and a dedicated public service. There were poems written about him, about his wonderful public service and his gentlemanly behavior. To Black New York, on the other hand, he was a dangerous, lawless menace. And we see that history repeating itself. The different perspectives that white and Black New York has about Riker's Island um, tracks very closely to the perspectives that they had more than a century ago about Rikers the man. A black New York was subject to over-policing, mass incarceration, and brutality at Rikers Island, while white New York largely saw nothing of them. And the powerful Black Lives Matters protests that emerged in the wake of the police murder of George Floyd forced this issue of structural racism into public discourse across the country and um, sort of reinforced a discourse that was going on already in New York City. And just an interesting side note that I'd like to point out, if you look at the image on the lower right, the center figure is abolitionist David Ruggles, who was the leader of the New York Committee of Vigilance and Riker's main opponent in that kidnapping club that I just described to you. So Rikers personally is reported to have led 600 enslaved people north to freedom, including Frederick Douglass, who's one of the um, sort of most eloquent um, representations from that era of the voice of um, what it meant to be an enslaved person and the, the vital importance of freedom. So the reason that I like to point this out, aside from the fact that um, Ruggles was Riker's main antagonist, is that this is believed to be the first, the very first American newspaper cartoon to feature an actual black person as opposed to a generic caricature of some kind. So this is Riker's Island. You can see um, underneath the current outline of the island, you can see the original outline of the island. Uh, New York City bought Rikers Island from the Rikers family in the late 1800s, and in 1932 uh, dedicated it as the main jail of New York City. And most of the current expanse of the island was built using forced prison labor to dump trash from Manhattan into the East River to reclaim the island's shoal. And until 1939, when the World's Fair, which was held in Queens, brought an end to this dumping, the island was, no, was noteworthy because it lit up the, the night sky because all of the coal refuse from Manhattan that was being dumped there uh, was on fire and there was smoke emanating from it. So from the very beginning, this island prison camp was a disaster. It's a penal colony to send brown and black New Yorkers to. And by every conceivable metric, it's toxic. In addition to the brutality that occurred there and the racism that it represents, it continues to off-gas methane to this day. It's also in the flight path of LaGuardia uh, Airport, and there's an immense noise burden on the island. So I want to share with you just a few of the headlines. This is, a, a, again, a map of Rikers Island. Um, and you can see most of the detainees come from five neighborhoods in New York. 80% of the people jailed on Rikers Island are pre-trial pre detainees, people who've been convicted of nothing. And I just want to share some of these headlines with you. And I want you to keep in mind as I share them with you that these are headlines about the violence of the guards at Rikers Island. The overwhelming majority of people who are, who've been incarcerated on Rikers are black and brown coming from these over-policed communities where stop and frisk was most egregious. And in Floyd versus the city of New York, a federal judge found that um, more than 80% of those suffering a stop and frisk at the hands of New York City Police Department were Black or Latino, and that they were, that these stop and frisks were unconstitutionally biased, and that the police had a policy of targeting Black and Latino young men. And as a result of these racist policies, that's how the majority of Rikers uh, Island detainees came to be detained on Rikers Island. The terrible case of Khalif Browder showed a bright spotlight onto what was going on at Rikers Island. As a 16-year-old, Khalif was arrested for a minor crime and was held at Rikers Island for three years, two of which were insolitary, awaiting his speedy trial. He was brutalized by guards and inmates. And he was eventually released without trial after spending three years at Rikers Island, but he was so traumatized by what happened to him that he wound up committing suicide. His experience prompted the Obama administration to call for rethinking solitary confinement entirely in the federal system. It also galvanized a public movement opposing mass incarceration. Under the leadership of Just USA, which is headed by formerly incarcerated individuals, the case for Riker, shutting Rikers gained power. 
And it was an audacious goal. It was not, let's make Rikers more humane. Let's make it a better jail, but shut it down. And I think there's an important lesson there. If you make sweeping demands for systemic change, you might not get it. But for sure, you're not going to get sweeping systemic change without such demands. And indeed, what, what happened subsequently in New York City would not have happened without people in the streets demanding that Rikers be closed. So city council um, responded to the ongoing protest and the city council speaker appointed a panel to investigate mass incarceration and Breakers Island in particular. She appointed the former chief judge of New York State, uh, Jonathan Littman, to head it. Jonathan Littman's uh, commission, it's called the Littman Commission Report, um, issued a report calling Rikers a stain on the city and unequivocally called for Rikers Island Correctional Facility to be shut. In the fall of 2019, City Council enacted Local Law 192 that mandates that Rikers will be shut. At the same time, New York State dramatically changed its bail laws, again responding to this intense public pressure, reducing the amount of bail and the offenses for which bail could be required. And surprise, surprise, it turns out if you don't demand bail from poor people, you don't need so many jails. From peak of around 20,000 people incarcerated in the 1990s, Rikers now holds 7,000 people, a number that is decreasing almost daily despite scary headlines to the contrary. So this leaves the question, what happens to the island after the jail shuts in just a couple of years? That's where Renewable Rikers comes in. A proposal to link decarceration and restorative environmental justice. And just sort of a, a quick explanation, as I use the term restorative, restorative justice, um, it, it encapsulates both redistribution and recognition. In the environmental context, restorative justice tends to focus on community harms and community restoration. And the Renewable Rikers Plan I'm going to describe offers a path forward not only for remediating and mitigating past environmental harms, but for providing public benefits that flow to the injured communities as a form of reparations, both for the environmental harms and for the, the carceral harms. So um, Renewable Rikers has its origin in this paragraph, which was on page 100 of the Littman Commission's 110-page report. As you can see, it suggested that after the, um, the jail is shut, we need to get some kind of renewable something. And Rikers uh, renewable Rikers advocates took that as an opening and ran with it. Connecting decarceration with environmental justice, we advocated using the closing of Rikers Island to right some old environmental wrongs. Wrongs, moreover, that led to an outsized pollution burden on the very same communities most impacted by incarceration on Rikers Island. So specifically, we focused on energy production. So this map shows you where energy is consumed in New York City. Uh, red means more power consumption. Uh, one of my colleagues at CUNY made this map. So Manhattan, as you can see, uh, consumes the lion's share of the power. Manhattan also is much whiter and much wealthier than the rest of New York City. Um, Brooklyn and Queens, which is over here in the yellow, has about three times as many people, but you can see it consumes much less power. So, oh, by the way, this is Rikers Island here. You can see there's one connection to the mainland for this penal colony. But where does the power come from? Because of transmission bottlenecks in the wealthy suburbs, New York law requires that 82% of New York City's power must be locally generated within the city itself. And the, um, the black dots on this map are the pinker plants. Notice how few of them are located in Manhattan, where the power is consumed. Uh, purple, by the way, is environmental justice communities. There are 16 peaker plants in New York City, and they're disproportionately located in communities of color in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. In fact, in the same communities, overburdened by incarceration on Rikers Island. So Renewable Rikers focuses on one particular aspect of this energy injustice in New York City, and that is the Power Now plan in, that cited 10 peaker plants in 2000, not in the distant past, relatively recently. In 2000, New York was in the midst of energy deregulation. California, which was ahead of New York in deregulation, was suffering through rolling blackouts. Even though it was clear at the time that manipulation of supply was behind those California uh, shortages, you may remember the Enron situation, the blackouts were used as an excuse in New York to cite these 10 peaker plants temporarily, it was supposed to be for three years, to see us through what was pitched as a looming energy catastrophe. And because it was an emergency and because they were temporary, the pitch was there was no time for environmental assessment. Even though
Although internal company documents showed that all of these peaker plants were destined for environmental justice communities that were already overburdened. They were all destined for minority communities. And that and also internal projections showed that the projected energy needs were vastly overstated to justify these facilities. Um, by the way, anyone born in the year these temporary plants were cited is now old enough to drink and the plants are still there. They're still spewing pollution into overburdened communities. For those of you unfamiliar with what a peak plant is, a New York City's public utility, New York's Public Utility Commission defines a peaker plant as one that operates less than 10% of the time. They phase on and off to meet peak demand, particularly in the summer for air pollution. Startup and shutdown are the most polluting times, and these plants cycle on and off regularly, spewing particulates, nitrous oxides, sulfur oxides into the air. And because of a quirk in U.S. environmental law, these plants don't meet modern uh, pollution safety standards. So these, pl these plants don't run very often, but they're extremely dirty. And this is a picture of one of them. Um, this was this is the Long Island City plant that was cited in 2000, and it's directly across the street from Queensbridge Houses, which is the largest public housing project in the United States. It has more than 3,100 apartments, virtually all of, of which are occupied by uh, Black and Latinx Americans. When running, the Peaker plants account for a, a huge share of New York City's air pollution, one third of the NOx and a huge chunk of the particulate matter, particularly PM 2.5. We know that um, PM 2.5 is intimately associated with COVID infection rates, as well as the underlying cardiopulmonary preconditions that make people more vulnerable to COVID. There's also a close association with asthma. Here's another map. Once again, the neighborhoods most impacted by mass incarceration at Rikers, neighborhoods overburdened with peaker plants, and the neighborhoods with the highest asthma rates closely aligned. Indeed, the five neighborhoods most impacted by Rikers um, can, can have as much as double the average New York City childhood asthma rate and an order of magnitude greater than the least impacted community. These are also the communities with the highest rates of asthma hospitalizations and deaths for both children and adults, and most recently, the highest COVID infection rate. New York City is also an urban heat island, meaning it has a higher ambient temperature than the surrounding less urbanized regions. And these high ambient temperatures translate into unsafe indoor air temperatures that jeopardize the health of vulnerable groups. Again, notice where the peaker plants are clustered. In or near high, risk, high heat risk communities, the communities that bear the burden of peak pollution are far less likely to have air conditioning on access to air conditioning on hot days. This is a profound inequity. And these are also, once again, the communities most affected by mass incarceration on Rikers Island. Um, these are also the, the communities with the highest COVID infection and death rates recently. And by 2050, New York City is expecting to see double the number of 90 degree days and the number of heat waves is expected to triple or quadruple. The heat island effect will get worse, magnifying the existing inequality. Um, New York City is also a severe non-attainment zone. And if you look, you see again, that same pattern that we've seen in all the other maps in terms of who is impacted. Um, however, peaker plants are extremely lucrative. Massive public subsidies keep them on standby. The kilowatt hours they generate are by far the most expensive power in New York, and that creates pressure from um, from sort of donated political donations to keep them open. This is where Renewable Rikers comes in. Renewable Rikers is a proposal to dedicate Rikers Island to energy generation, or at least a portion of the island, to energy generation and battery storage in order to remove the gas-fired peaker plants located in environmental justice take them out of those communities and turn the land over the communities for something that's more beneficial. Now, according to a preliminary CUNY analysis, 35 acres of solar panels installed in Rikers Island could generate 14.6 megawatts and um, about 17.2 gigawatts annually, which is like a significant percentage of what speaker plants generate. A mere 12 acres, 4% of the island, could potentially hold um, more than 1,500 megawatts worth of energy storage, which is about half the goal New York State has set for itself. So most of the peaker plants run for only a few hours at a time, making it entirely feasible to replace them with renewable rights. And removing noxious environmental uses from the communities that were most overburdened by uh, mass incarceration at Rikers and bear the burden of the city's energy generation would be a kind of restorative justice that for the communities that play unwilling hosts to these facilities. It could be green space or affordable housing or whatever those communities think would benefit them the most. 
By embracing the possibility of transformation behind the drive to shut Rikers Island, um, Renewable Rikers offers environmental restorative justice for these communities. Um, and the idea is also to tie this to job training so that the formerly incarcerated on Rikers Island can get the benefit of these fast growing green jobs. Um, in the United States right now, solar technician and wind turbine technician are the two fastest job growing uh, fastest growing job categories, albeit from a small uh, base. But the idea is that those jobs and the training for them would go to those who've been formerly incarcerated at Rikers. Now, shifting changes in New York and New York City law make this a real possibility, as does the Biden administration's recent executive orders about transitioning from fossil fuels. So in 2019, New York State adopted the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act which requires that 70% of the state's electricity be renewable by 2030 and 100% be carbon free by 2040. And there's more, section seven of this act uh, requires that state entities consider in permitting whether or not any permits, licenses, or approvals are consistent with these greenhouse gas emissions targets. It's particularly important because many of the peaking plants that I showed you on the map must renew their permits in the next couple of years. So they're going to be subject to this um, requirement. And this state law prioritizes environmental and energy justice. Um, under local law 60, New York City has similar obligations to identify environmental justice communities. And as we said, a large percentage of Rikers um, inmates came from five neighborhoods that rank high on any list of environmental injustice. So um, just a bit, really, I'm almost done, I promise. Just a little bit about the process of making renewable rankers a reality. And I just, I'm sorry, it's still a work in progress. So I had the honor to testify at this hearing in February, 2020 um, for the trio of bills that make, collectively make up renewable rankers. And I get sad every time I look at this because it was one of the last things I did before New York City shut down entirely. The idea behind these three bills is to tie the pending shutdown of the Rikers Island Correctional Facility to restorative environmental justice. And um, this is the uh, the man on the right is the city council speaker, and he opened the hearing so uh, with a full throated support for the proposal. The man on the left is really the architect, um, Costa Constantinides. And um, he's also the architect of Local Law 97, which mandates dramatic improvements in building efficiency for existing buildings in New York City, a change that by itself will reduce the U.S. carbon emissions by 1.5% overall. Um, and it's a true statement that if we meet or if we manage in the United States to meet or exceed our Paris commitment, it will be due to the Biden administration, but also in no small part due to Council member Constantinides' vision here in New York City. So over the years, I've had the honor of working closely with him on renewable records and on other projects and on the uh, environmental justice bills the city adopted in 2017. Unfortunately, soon after this 2020 hearing, uh, city council closed and all hearings were suspended, temporarily stalling these initiatives. And um, council member Constantinides came down with a terrible case of COVID, one that ultimately forced him forced him to retire from his council seat. However, in February of 2021, all three bills were finally enacted. And um, introduction 1592 transfers jurisdiction of Rikers Island from the Department of Correction to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. What that means is that it will no longer be a jail at all. Uh, introduction 1593 and um, 1591 require investigative studies for the, uh, the island's potential to generate and store renewable energy and wastewater treatment. And um, they offered the city a path to building a hub for sustainability and resilience that could serve as a model for cities around the world. Now, what's not shown in this picture, because this is just the council members themselves, is the galley, which is filled with activists, all of whom were testifying, all of whom were writing letters and marching in the streets and pressuring their elected representatives to make this happen. And um, this legislation is really a landmark recognizing that social justice and environmental justice go hand in hand with racial justice and that achieving a just future requires advancing all of those uh, issues simultaneously. Now this is a profound 
um, racial justice and environmental justice issue, it's also a, a profound climate issue. Because um, this map, which shows you the, um, the hundred year floodplain in darker blue and the light gray is the same projections using more dire predictions, shows you what's gonna happen to the plant that generates 60% of New York City's energy um, over the coming years. Now, Rikers Island, on the other hand, is largely above the 100-year floodplain, and most of it is above the 500-year floodplain. So moving energy generation to there meets climate goals um, on a host of levels, right? From reducing emissions to uh, climate-proofing our energy infrastructure. Now, I tell you about this as an academic who's written extensively about the project, and um, as an advocate who worked hard to build a political coalition to make this possible. But for me, this is also extremely personal because this is the view from my window. So this affects me personally as well as professionally and as well as a member of this society. And I think I'm just going to stop right there and um, see if there are any questions. So thank you very much for listening to me. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, thanks so much, Rebecca. And I, as soon as there we go, I'm going to stop my sharing. I think uh, we're gonna we're gonna maybe hold questions until the end of all the presentations, if that's okay. Um, there is a chat box that people can put questions in, but also um, at the end of the presentations, you're welcome to turn on your cameras or turn on your mics and, and ask questions yourself. Um, but uh, but I'm gonna go straight into my presentation, um, which which I think uh, follows on. Um, from Becker's in some ways. Sorry, I'm just gonna share my slides. Okay, can everyone see that? Um, I can't hear you, but let me know if, if you if you can't see that. Um, yes, we can see that. Thanks, Dina. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about participation in justice and resistance. Um, and I think it builds very much on Rebecca's presentation, which is, which is, which is in many ways uh, the story about um, directly affected communities kind of creating their own um, uh, vision of how um, a, a policy should go forward and sort of creating their own process for, for, for pushing that onto the agenda. Um, so, just to start with a little spiel on participation. Participation, particularly uh, in the form of consultation in the context of um, indigenous and mining affected communities, which is really where my work lies, um, has come to play a, a kind of really um, major, almost um, outsized role, some people think, in environmental law and rights. And it does this in a number of ways. Um, it is, um, it is critical uh, to, the, to the communities, to the people who are affected, uh, who, who get to have a say, uh, to be heard, to, to articulate um, and share uh, what is important to them, but also what they recognize as the kind of impacts of an activity and to learn about the sorts of activities that affect them. But it's also participation is also crucial to decision makers. It's not just for participants, it's also for policy makers and decision makers who cannot make sound, inclusive, um, responsive and reactive decisions that are appropriate to the affected communities without engaging in participation. And I think Rebecca's um, presentation really kind of showed that, showing the sort of layers of concerns and interests that communities have in Rikers, the different ways in which the same community is affected by Rikers. This kind of information is not always kind of available to decision makers through an EIA. Um, it's, it's the kind of thing that only comes when you engage directly with affected communities. And that information is essential to, to, to sound decision making. Participation is also uh, important because when it fails, when it doesn't happen, um, not only do you end up with maladaptive policies um, and decision making processes uh, that, that don't reflect the interests and needs of those who are affected, um, but it's also associated with a kind of profound disrespect of uh, human dignity. So, so exclusion from participation processes is often experienced as a kind of silencing, but also as a profound disrespect in which 
communities express not only their say not having been heard or, or appreciated, but also they themselves as being seen as kind of um, without value in the process. Um, but in the context of indigenous, rural, marginalized and oppressed communities, participation often fails. It doesn't create the space for affected communities to assert themselves, to have their say. Um, rather, it kind of compels them to do so sometimes in contexts and forms that are problematic. Uh, just to say something about the pictures that you're looking at, um, these are pictures that come from um, my time working uh, as an attorney for mining affected communities from participation processes that I was involved in. And this is a picture of Thelma Nkosi, who is a community leader in Pumalanga. Um, she she uh, was in a video in which she kind of described the hard time she had getting a mining company simply to talk to her community and, as she put it, to speak in one voice. Um, in my experience working as an attorney with these communities, my clients and I either directly experienced or witnessed um, hugely problematic practices and participation processes. So mining companies only consulted with um, traditional leaders or, or often in fact bribed traditional leaders. Um, they didn't provide the information they were meant to provide. They only provided it at some inaccessible location. They lied to the community about the nature of the consultation. They lied to decision makers about the outcomes of the consultation. They only allowed men in the room to speak. They only allowed the elderly in the room to speak. They only let themselves speak and didn't let community members speak at all. They falsified documents. They falsified signatures. They sent in the police to kill people and terrorize communities. They pitted community groups against each other. They houses on fire in the night. In the picture, you see on the left-hand side, Sikosipa Bazuka Radebe, who is a human rights defender who was murdered in 2016, and Mamfakile Nshangase, an environmental and human rights activist who was murdered in 2020. And no arrests have been made in relation to either of these murders. In my uh, presentation today, in the next few minutes, I want to argue that we often think that participatory processes fail because something goes wrong in the process itself. We think the failures were the result of uh, bad or greedy men leading those processes or of poor enforcement and oversight by government officials. Um, and often the language around participation says, were we to simply design better processes were we to support these processes and the communities with the resources they needed, if we uh, made sure we had stronger safeguards or proper implementation, were we to wrest consultation out of the hands of, um, of, of greedy men, then meaningful, uh, effective, dignity-centered participation would be possible and would give effect to communities to have a platform to have their say. Um, but despite the efforts of affected communities to speak, to attend consultation meetings, to obtain the necessary data, to access internet, online meetings that are increasingly where um, consultation processes are taking place, um, despite all the work they do to try and have their say in consultation processes that are ostensibly designed for that purpose, they often find that they are unable to have their say. And this is not because they don't come out with the right words in the right place at the right time, but rather it's because they are not heard. I am increasingly of the view um, that even in the best of circumstances, even in a fully informed, timeless, fair, free participation process, all participation processes are plagued by problems that cannot simply be regulated away. And these are failures of the hearer. We tend to focus on participation as giving those affected a platform to have their say. And in focusing on the platform and the speaking, we fail to look at the audience, the listeners, the hearers who have it within their power to entirely undermine a consultation process by simply failing to hear. My research looks at the ways that practices of silencing and epistemic injustice prevent indigenous communities from having their say in consultation processes, even in circumstances when they are coming out with the right words at the right time and place. 
even in contexts in which it appears that the basic necessary requirements for consultation are met. The community has a place at the table, so to say, but they are nevertheless prevented from having their say because they are not heard as they intend to be heard, or they are not believed, or they are not recognized as having the epistemic authority or credibility that they do in fact have. Rather than being heard, they experience practices of silence and epistemic violence. This failure of hearers, I want to argue, is critical not only because consultation fails, but because increasingly participation processes, consultation processes have become the only way for affected communities to engage in the decisions that are being made about their environments. Participation is in many cases, not an aspect of environmental rights for marginalized communities, but the entirety of those rights. Community rights to land, to healthy environments, to family life are all subject to negotiation and securing them often means negotiating for them in a participation process. Likewise, proposing alternatives, engaging in co-production, entering benefit sharing agreements, these all depend on participatory processes, one in which those affected are called to the table, as it were, and are required to give accounts of themselves, of their lives and their experiences. But approaches to consultation often assume we speak to each other in the same way, and that if the affected community has a platform, the consultant will be able to hear them. But we don't always speak in the same way. And often the ways affected communities speak are not easily translatable into the language of negotiations or consultations. This is a problem that includes the problem of language. So consultation processes and EIA information is still often generated in a language that the communities don't speak. It's the language of the consultant or the consulted. But it also goes beyond this issue of uh, choice of language and translation. Take, for example, um, Bonakilium Twa, who you can see on the left of the screen there in two stills from a video interview she did. Uh, she's a member of the Amadiba community. And she described the difficulties she encountered engaging with um, a, a community from the city who came to visit. In the stills you see on the slide, she says, uh, I love to speak, but I love to pass the message by singing traditional songs. But when Akile realizes that to be understood, to be heard, she can't uh, speak through song. Her audience don't understand her songs and she has to stop singing and she has to start speaking. So to participate, she has to change her way of speaking. We also see this idea of different ways of speaking um, in uh, the Kuwararig Aboriginal First Nations people's submission to the UN Economic and Social Rights Council. In their submission, they describe their experience of the state's efforts to obtain consent by covert means, including by failing to listen to the ways they speak through silence. Our known cultural norms, they wrote, are our known cultural norms of silence, sorry, are interpreted by non-native rules of debate and majority votes and are duly registered as our agreement, despite our cultural norms of silence indicating respect and or disagreement um, or discomfort, our silence is turned against us and used to indicate our consent. In addition to speaking in different ways, parties often do not share the necessary hermeneutical resources to understand each other. In other words, the consultants lack the concepts that the consulted use to describe and make sense of their experiences, but at the same time, they impose their own concepts onto the communities they want to consult with. So Carl J. White, um, who you see in the photo there, he's an um, indigenous philosopher based in the States. He's argued that concepts such as climate change or the Anthropocene have been foisted onto indigenous peoples without their participation or agreement. And the ideological and temporal frames um, that these concepts suggest make little sense to, the, to indigenous peoples. White argues that climate change is not some new crisis as it's, as it's often articulated, but the continuation of a crisis that is ongoing since the beginning of colonization. 
under which indigenous people faced environmental destruction, land disposition, forced relocation, and the ending of their relationships to plants, animals, and entire ecosystems. Climate change just promises more of the same, but so do the kind of policies and processes that uh, ostensibly seek to solve the climate change crisis, including programs like Red Plus and alternative energy projects. These end up being yet more modes of authority and regulation that prevent indigenous peoples from living on and with their land, resulting again in forced removals and the ending of relationships with plants and animals. And we see an example of this in Kenya with the Waitata people, who are subsistence agriculturalists, um, who practiced seasonal grazing and hunting um, before colonization. With colonization, land in Kenya was all turned into crown land, um, and the community's land was handed over to white farmers um, for coffee farming, and, uh, and some of it was used to establish um, a, a large national park for the pleasure of colonial tourists. Then at independence, um, there was a land distribution, redistribution program, um, and a series of ranches were created that were meant to protect the community, but instead a group of um, elites managed to capture the process, register the land in their own names, um, rendering the communities legally landless, um, and, and, and using the land to sort of profit to raise funds. Today, this area is the subject of a uh, Red Plus project site. Um, and again, this has generated a consultation process and various financial benefits for the registered landowners, but its effect on the community is that they can no longer uh, engage in the various income generating activities that they had sort of practiced um, um, as well as their cultural activities and they've seen very little of the financial benefits of the red scheme. So from this point of view, for indigenous peoples like the Taita, red plus renewable energy projects, climate change and colonization itself exist in a continuum, they're on a spectrum. And the idea of crisis and of solution are not common then between indigenous peoples and for example, climate change policymakers. To go back to this slide, another example from the Kuraareg, that's their um, symbol you see on the, on the slide there. They point to conceptual gaps, highlighting the fact that the word consent has no equivalent word in their language. So in their submission to the UN, they pick the word in English apart, examine its etymology, and in doing so, they reveal not only the awkwardness of forcing people to fit their self-expression into foreign concepts and terms, but also the hidden and historical meanings of notions of consultation and consent in English. So differing ideas of crisis and solution and of consent itself are not just, to my mind, conceptual misunderstandings that can sort of be cleared up through uh, discussion. Rather, I think that consultants tend to lack the hermeneutic resources with which to even begin to make sense of indigenous experiences. In addition to lacking common modes, ways of speaking, and lacking common concepts with which to make sense of the world, audiences also often suffer from a kind of ignorance that inhibits meaningful listening. Um, some years ago, I was based at the University of Oslo, and I attended a talk on the topic of free prior and informed consultation. Um, and this talk was attended by a very large number of CEOs of Norwegian uh, renewable energy companies. Norway is one of the major funders of uh, renewable energy projects, particularly hydro projects abroad, and particularly in Latin America. And so many of the companies that are rolling out these projects are based there and their uh, senior managers were all attending this talk. And the speaker was describing the requirements of uh, free prior informed consultation and explaining how it had kind of become concretized as a sort of formal legal obligation. And one of the CEOs raised this sort of really uh, agitated hand. Um, and he said, you know, we try and consult these people, but they don't understand that this development is for their own good. So, I was very struck by this and I was struck by how in believing that damming up a river on indigenous land is kind of for their own good, 
the CEO displayed not only kind of a profound lack of awareness of the temporal and in-place conditions in which many indigenous communities lived, but also in his mission to save indigenous peoples from themselves, he seemed to have no concept of the ways in which the affected communities understand their own histories, their own environments, or even the so-called climate crisis that he thought radically justified transforming their lives and territories. And I think that all too often indigenous peoples find themselves having to explain and to often evidence their own experiences of oppression to those whose ignorance prevents proper consultation and engagement. As a result, these communities are required to undertake an unpaid, unnoticed, emotionally taxing kind of coerced labor. As Audre Lord, who you see in the middle of the slide there put it, Black and third world people are expected to educate white people as to our humanity. The oppressors maintain their position and evade their responsibility for their own actions. Affected communities in this way are exposed to practices of what Nora Berenstain, who you um, can see in the bottom right corner, has called epistemic exploitation. Berenstain argues that this draining and unpaid epistemic labor centers the needs and the desires of the dominant groups I would say in this case, the consultants, the states, the mining companies, and exploits the emotional and cognitive labor of members of marginalized groups who are required to do the unpaid, unacknowledged work of providing information and providing resources. Having to explain one's experience of oppression to skeptical outsiders um, is not consultation. Rather than being given a space to tell their stories and account for themselves, to participate, Indigenous communities are compelled to do so. They're forced to expose themselves, often in hostile consultation processes with ignorant audiences. But addressing the ignorance of consultants, of mining company CEOs, is, is an essential first step for any engagement or conversation or consultation to take place. But it is not the objective of consultation. And, and I haven't seen any projects in which it is a priority in any consultation process that aims to make the time or the room or the resources available to teach consultants how to engage in consultation in conditions of oppression for indigenous groups. But demanding that speakers account for themselves to ignorant and often unsympathetic audiences is not only, uh, not only results in epistemic exploitation, but may also result in a kind of coerced silencing um, or, a, or a distorting of the speech of indigenous peoples. Christy Dodson, whose picture you see um, in the left corner there, has argued that a hearer's persistent and robust failure to understand the speaker's sorry, <laughs> perspective and social experience renders that hearer incompetent to properly comprehend the prophet's speech. And this may mean that the speaker doesn't speak at all or changes, distorts their claims to only address that which the audience demonstrates competence for. In my experience working with mining affected communities, I regularly watched communities reduce and change and distort their arguments, making them smaller, haggling over details of the mining uh, process, agreeing to not talk about apartheid, or spatial injustice because the mining representatives or the natural scientists or whoever the consultants were didn't feel it was relevant and felt it didn't move the conversation forward. Perhaps most importantly, participation processes with indigenous and marginalized peoples, even well-designed processes are in, in many cases calling on these communities to participate in decisions that will result in one way or another in the destruction of their land, of their communities, of their culture, of their lifestyles and of their livelihoods. That this is the context in which people must participate should not be forgotten. No matter how committed or involved or open-minded the people on the other side of the table are, they're not participating in a discussion on negotiation about their own destruction. This context of threat and history is not only critical to understand the real pressure under which affected communities are required to participate in these processes, but it's also important to understand the extraordinary hurdles that communities must get over 
in order to begin to engage with antagonistic and often ignorant outsiders. Given the enormity of the impact of these decisions and the long history of oppression and exclusion indigenous peoples have faced, they have demanded the right not only to consultation with, with significant impact in international law, not only to consultation, but also to consent. And consent, or rather the right to say no, does seem to address many of the problems I've been discussing here. It allows communities to have their say by creating the opportunity to say no, since no is all that's required to refuse consent as it's normally understood. Communities are not compelled to tell their stories or to educate ignorant outsiders. The right to withhold consent then does more to protect the self-expression of these communities than participatory consultation processes do. The problem is that consent has not been uh, defined this way by states, even states who recognize the right to consent. Rather, when they think about consent, they envision the giving of consent, saying yes, as the ideal outcome of some consultation process and have largely refused to acknowledge that consent gives communities a right to simply say no. In any case, as the Kuwararig Aboriginal First Nations people have argued, consent is not possible when indigenous peoples are living in a governance system and under an authority they never agreed to. Since the Kuwararig did not consent to the current Australian governance framework that has been imposed on their land and lives in disregard of their own governance systems, they see no possibility of consent to new developments or climate projects that try to take place within that framework. So instead of participation as consultation, and this is my last point, or some watered down version of participation as consent, I propose that what meaningful engagement demands is greater recognition of participation as resistance. Communities across the world engage in participation through resistance using protest, online campaigns, barricades, property destruction slogans, Communities attend consultation meetings, but they refuse to go in, they stand outside, they sing, they protest, they refuse to sign attendance registers. This has been a, this has been a hugely important um, strategy used by communities in South Africa. And sometimes they even violently evict consultants from meeting rooms or from their community land. Communities recognize the ways in which their stories and their participation has been used against them and they have refused to participate in ways that are open to abuse. In, in, in resistance, in acts of protest, they are asserting themselves in two ways. They are expressing their objections through the protest, but at the same time, they're refusing to occupy the small and ungiving space of consultation that compels them to engage, to tell their stories in a particular way. That these acts of resistance communicate a position, they are speech acts in regard to the planned project of the land is indisputable. And yet they are really treated as participation. If anything, the opposite is true. Acts of resistance are more often taken as forms of non-participation. They're treated as acts of non-speech, uh, as in uh, we tried to talk to the community, but they refused to speak to us. They just threw us off their land or, or uh, protested, so consultation is impossible. But of course, these are acts of participation and they are acts of self-assertion and they are acts of participation that are controlled by the affected groups themselves. And as such, these can be means to better ensure a say than processes of participation that compel communities to tell their stories again and again to an unhearing audience. Because creating opportunities for people to speak means little when they have no reason to think that their audiences will hear them. Listening, on the other hand, when people speak, whether they speak in protest or in song or in silence, is what's called for, and this requires recognition of resistance rather than more forced consultation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dina. And I think I, I hop in here now. Um, I'm just putting a timer on for myself. Um, so yeah, I'm so, so happy to go after you, Dina, because you paved the way for so much of um, what we're doing here in South Africa. And it's nice to hear this from a fellow South African. Um, 
So yeah, I'm just going to share my screen and um, I, I'm very excited to respond to a lot of what you're saying um, and actually going to kind of jump around my presentation in a way because there's so much what you've raised for us now, which speaks to some of the big struggles we've had. Um, and I think my first point was just to say the, the, uh, the incredible amount of labor that the uh, oppressed groups have to go through in order to participate. We have seen more and more as scholar activists, our role is to take on a lot of that labor. You know, Paula Freire always spoke about pedagogy of the oppressed and we sometimes feel like a big part of our work is pedagogy of the oppressors and, and helping and putting ourselves in those spaces to help with some of that, taking on some of that labor. Uh, and using our privilege and our space to kind of do that. So um, can, can everyone see my screen? Um, I'm going to, I can yes. see your face. Um, yeah, okay. Great. So thank you so much. I'm speaking on behalf of a, a large team and um, we're part of the One Ocean Hub uh, Collective. Um, uh, but today I'm going to really speak about our work in Empathetheater, which over the last um, eight years, we've been facilitating um, kind of new public platforms for a different approach to decision making that um, really challenges a lot of the ways, the existing ways that Dina has so beautifully described that are so imp almost impossible to to work to work through or to meaningfully engage with. So we, I'm speaking first of an, a, a case study um, project we developed um, collaboratively with communities up along our KwaZulu-Natal um, uh, coastline in South Africa. And the project is called Lalelo Luantle, which is Isi Zulu for Listen to the Sea. But I thought before I do that, I would just show a short video, which kind of helps give a, a very um, quick and short uh, insight into the methodology that is Empitheater, and then I'll, I'll take it from there. So, oh wait, I realized I didn't do something. Sorry, I'm just gonna, oh, I did just check it's optimized so you can hear it properly. So here we go. Complex problems in unequal societies require careful yet rigorous explorations of different ways of knowing, being and doing. When popular and political debates are polarized and filled with judgments, entangled livelihoods and marginalized voices are often ignored. It's why we believe that creative and empathetic methods can facilitate multiple forms of listening to and sharing knowledge across diverse publics. Empathetheater is one such method. Emerging from the South African context, Empathetheater has, over the past five years, developed innovative new ways of constructing social spaces for equitable public dialogue. Creating an amphitheater for empathy that embraces, rather than shies away from, complex entanglements in society. Since 2014, the Empathetheater team has tackled social concerns ranging from land-based mining and displacement, street-level drug addiction, the vulnerability of migrant women and the impacts of xenophobia, gentrification and public housing conflicts, and more recently, ocean heritage and governance. Empathetheater nurtures not only public storytelling, but attentive story listening. This research-based theater method offers a new form of participatory justice in decision-making, meaning-making, and solidarity building across societal spheres. The empathetheater process begins with extensive action-based research. Here, the creative team, co-participants and key partners work to identify matters of critical concern for social justice and together define a pressing central question. The empathetheater team then set out to explore this question with as many people from diverse backgrounds as possible listening to multiple narratives that relate to the topic from different scales and positionalities, interrogating archives and reading broadly. The creative team then bring these findings together and works to shape the research into an engrossing, relevant and true-to-life theatrical script. 
the initial iteration of the script is first shared with participants and partners in table readings and other formats to test and verify the credibility of the play. The empathy team identifies and rehearse a theatrical production and share this again with relevant knowledge holders from a variety of backgrounds. In this way, the team are continuously enriching and verifying the research. Once the project collaborators are happy with the production, performances are rolled out to strategic audiences across the country. Policymakers, participants and other concerned publics are invited to sit together and experience the production. Empathetic audiences are generally made up of people with different levels of agency, power and privilege in relation to the matter of concern being explored in the play. Ideally, invited audience members should hold diverse, even conflicting views on the central concern represented. Post-play conversations are then carefully facilitated as public dialogues between the audience, the actors and playmakers, allowing for yet another layer of research in consultation with the public to emerge. Since its inception, Amphitheater Productions have reached thousands of South Africans. With performances opening international conferences, community meetings, and theater festivals. Venues for Amphitheater performances have ranged from state-of-the-art theaters and art galleries, to church and school halls, police stations, football fields, aquariums, rehabilitation centers, and homeless shelters. Across these various processes, Empathiata works to amplify a chorus of voices particularly those of marginalized groups with and for our non-academic research partners in powerful and validating ways. Moving forward, Empathiata is expanding into international policy dialogue as well as further grassroots engagement aiming to deepen and enrich our ability to support democratic decision-making processes. If you would like to join these efforts, get involved, donate, or learn more, please visit our website at www.empatheater.com. So, <clears throat> thanks. So that just gives us a chance to just get a, a sense of the methodology, so I don't have to go too much into that and focus more on this particular example. Um, and later we'll have some, I can answer some questions. But Lalela Olwantle really began with us noticing something, and that something is really what Dina's just really outlined, is the, the many hurdles in which communities, um, and I use that term very carefully here, I would say ocean defenders in this case, or citizens along our coast, were kind of lumped together as community, as a, a group of voices who just didn't want, in this case, um, one of the issues, although there were many nexus issues that coastal communities identified, you know, that first step for us is co-defining a matter of concern. Um, and I'm speaking at this, by us, I mean scholar activists, so researchers who've kind of dedicated our work to kind of co-conspiring and working with um, oppressed groups to help with the um, participation process uh, and to change it. Um, so what we were noticing is this, this way in which... Um, in this case with um, offshore drilling and oil and gas exploration off our coastline was kind of taking this incredibly complex sector of society. I mean, we have many languages, many different um, demographics, all kind of coming together with very different and nuanced questions around on, on this oil and gas of why they don't want it. So the many reasons were very complex um, and what questions they had but this just gets lumped together as the community versus the mining company. Um, and so we really wanted to make, make that a bit more messy and flesh that out and see if there's a way in which we could facilitate a different kind of public tribunal process that um, 
although at the time didn't have much legitimacy as a legal process, it could facilitate a different way in which that dialogue could happen and kind of contribute to what Dina was saying, a, a kind of um, popular education approach to expanding the hermeneutic language and the uh, perspective between the different worldviews and kind of working very much from an epistemic justice um, uh, process. So, as I said, the early part of the work is this um, deep ethnographic work, uh, participant in, um, observation, interviews, focus groups, um, mapping all the different concerns and also mapping the various different um, partners in civil society, CBOs, and then just individual champions. Um, uh, in this case, we're looking at all kinds of people, so from fisher folk to um, people in, in, in government to civil society partners. Um, this is my colleague Taryn Pereira, who I uh, work very closely with, um, really doing deep, long oral histories with different researchers as well. This is Pelele Mbatha, who's also part of the One Ocean Hub at UCT, who had worked for many years looking at benefit sharing and the impacts of um, the big kind of blue economy decisions on, on coastal communities or coastal groups. So we do this I'm kind of really cutting through this, but we really do this in-depth research over a year or two. And then we come together as a community of concerned citizens, scholar activists, writers, and then the theater makers as part of our team. And we use building a script, kind of building a narrative as an analytical tool that's more public and accessible. So it kind of de the way in which we research a concern. And, and we can then also work with what Dina was saying about how um, with the one um, act, activist that was, uh, was that, I think that was the um, Kolobeni uh, activist who was saying, you know, I can't sing, you know, like I have to then speak. And so working with theater, it allows us to, to work um, and honor the ways of knowing and being and doing and expressing that um, certain groups have, have chosen to express their concerns or their questions. So we can, we try in that scripting process to develop and I, um, characters that represent those. Um, it also allows us to protect identities of different ocean defenders or environmental defenders um, if, if, if it's needed. Um, but so we do this work and we, we get a script. And then there's a lot of iterative call and response. And in, in South Africa and in Southern Africa, there's this tradition of call and response singing. So you might've heard it a lot. It's very, it's very part of the culture in Nguni culture where one person will sing out a phrase and then many people will respond. And this call and response is very much the metaphor of our approach to research. It's very dialogical. We constantly in conversation. So there's many iterations of the script that goes back to civil society partners, go back to different knowledge holders or heritage knowledge holders, um, so that we ensure that everyone's happy <clears throat> with this first draft of the script, which then gets, this is the process of ongoing consultation around developing the script. So the script sits as a kind of artifact um, and a tool, an instrument for us to express the many different concerns of, of um, in this case, the citizens along the coastline. And then we create the play. So the play is this um, uh, kind of, embodied uh, like report that has a research report that has been made by a community group or in this case many citizens along the coastline so we've worked with various different types of communities as you saw in the first video but in this case we we would we really could get we have three characters who could speak to three very specific areas of concern and um and the, there's the history of migrant um, indentured labor, Indian labor into Durban and a long cultural historical relationship with uh, coastal fishing. Um, so there's, and, and the story is told with three characters and they're three generations. So we can tell the whole, the history um, of what's happened and how dispossession um, has occurred in South Africa from a Zulu character's perspective, from an Indian character's perspective, and then from a white woman's perspective. Um, the Indian character is based on a lot of the interviews we had with um, uh, uh, civil society partners and activists. Um, the, the Zulu character is based on Sangomas, so traditional healers, and Zionists and the kind of um, 
uh, Nguni mysticism and spirituality connected to the sea, but also the experiences of communities' dispossession for marine protected areas being moved and displaced for the marine protected areas and for other forms of extractive development and the, the apartheid group areas act. And then the white scientist, she um, is like a composite character of various different researchers um, and their conflicts you know, the conflicts between science and sociology and around this, these questions of marine protection or sustainability and so on. And so they are involved in a, a kind of a chorus of a dialogue of their different concerns that are messy and not easily fitted into each other. But there is a kind of... Um, there is a kind of harmony that's brought between these different dialogues that allows to at least open up in like a Frarian sense, a generative theme for conversation. So that by the time we've performed the play, there can be a rich dialogue um, with uh, uh, citizens um, uh, around it and it becoming a kind of public tribunal. So um, we did this and we, we um, we can also just to say that also the script itself becomes a policy brief, but in where we can use vernacular, we can use idiomatic thinking, so we can work in languages and in in ways in which um, people are communicating, and that the play itself becomes a policy brief. So it's not this dry document, but it's this gripping narrative. But the research notes are in the footnotes, so you can you can locate the research. Um, that, that citizens are doing themselves, community partners. This is their research. It's just, it's produced in a very different kind of collaborative way. So you can see a lot of this on our website um, and you can just also go to our YouTube channel to watch some of the videos on it. But I just wanted to mention one of the things that Dina mentioned, and I quickly threw this in now while listening to her, um, was we are also found stories that sit at the interface of um, uh, and I suppose the best way to put this is, for, uh, as Saskia Vermeulen puts it, is law as law. So folklore, you know, the customary law works. So this question around how intangible forms of knowing and being and doing around place and land, about the deep spirituality that's connected to land, that often gets glossed over because there isn't the, the kind of capacity in legislation, in consultants to understand why this cannot go ahead. Why can't you mine the deep sea? Well, for Nguni people, mining the deep sea is the equivalent of mining heaven because this animation we're currently working on, these are just um, storyboards. Um, we're in a stage of building this animation, which will be launched at the end of the year, is taking oral histories from Sangomas who explain very clearly that after you bury your family members, the rain comes and presses the soul out of your body. The soul then drips into the groundwater and travels through the river systems to the ocean where you then met by your, your ancestors. And so this, this very intangible concept that most South Africans actually don't know. They don't know that um, when we are spending time in the ocean and doing, we actually, for a large propor proportion of our, our, our um, fellow citizens, this is a very sacred place that gets, is being kind of utilized in a very unconscious way by uh, capitalist systems and Western perspectives of recreation even. Um, so so we, we kind of... Um, problematizing that and this is a new area in which we're exploring since COVID seen as we can't do theater in the way we used to we've turned La Lela Luantli also into a radio play which you can listen to um, on our website and you can kind of immerse yourself in the narrative stories of the complexities as Dina was saying like the complexities in which communities or uh, defenders environmental in our case ocean defenders are articulating and trying to say like what is um, what they're struggling with. So yeah, so that's just to say we have um, we're exploring um, using these artifacts now, where you kind of making intangible uh, heritages a bit more tangible in the legal process. I've got only a minute left, but just to say, um, uh, okay, these are some of the things we touched on in the play, which I'm not going to go into. Um, but what was very, what I just wanted to bring in also is Kira Erwin, who we work with closely as she's one of our um, partners in Empathy at the Durban, Urban, uh, Urban Future Center at 
at Durban University of Technology. She talks about our work also, is also about um, sculpting an audience with ears. So Dina was talking about how often the people are not listening and there's a lot of labor we have to put in also um, as policymakers or as researchers, oh, there's my timer, but as um, a kind of scholar activists in helping build that. And what's so beautiful about storytelling and public storytelling is if you're working with decision makers um, and, and you're doing interviews of them and including their stories alongside the stories of uh, partners, people beget, become um, invested in where is this play going? Because they being they being they see themselves in the play, so they kind of get more involved in kind of ongoing conversations with you, and they're wanting to um, stick stick in for the long run with you. So that every time you perform the play or, or produce a have a meeting, they come because they they you know they they they're curious. Their egos are curious about how they're going to be depicted in the story, um, and that's opened up an opportunities for us to build empathetic um, opportunities between different knowledge holders and between, in, in often cases, oppressor and oppressed. Um, so just to say that the Lalelo Wanchle's biggest output was building the Coastal Justice Network. All those audiences we'd, we'd collected over traveling, touring the play just before lockdown, the 2019, we toured up and down the coastline and we built a network um, that Taryn has really led. Uh, along with the researcher called Jackie Sunday, uh, Sund. And yeah, this network is trying to build um, a, a different way of, 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 of not only being a watchdog to injustices, but to building a knowledge action network where we can help support and be in service of champions and, and an ocean, ocean defenders along the coastline. So there's various um, things we're f tracking and following everything from human rights violations to killings of ocean defenders um and, do, and helping sometimes we help write press press releases it's not just plays we're making we're also writing um buildings like citizen journalism and writing um press releases uh and then also doing a lot of brokering work with government officials i just want to quickly cut to and then we do a lot of call and response by creating small little pieces based on, 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 uh, on, on communities' voices uh, across the country. So we've built like WhatsApp groups, um, online groups for, for ocean defenders where they can share their, their own personal research that they're doing. I just want to cut to something that happened a few weeks ago where we had this poor consult, like extremely poor and very weak consultation over the last like decade or longer around marine protected areas and now what's be beginning to become marine spatial planning and just the incompetency of government officials to fully understand how poorly they're explaining maps and mapping and the ways in which how we're mapping the ocean we see a lot of this stuff happening in the terrestrial space but we're looking at very unique ways of storytelling and counter hegemonic mapping so this is Butle um here uh, and Taryn um, working with a community we're working closely with was fisher cooperatives. We were finally, after some like few months of work with government officials, got them to come to in a room to to really respond to the the poor poor consultation, and just how powerful it was when we could just actually recreate a map together, um, and what conversations and dialogue that led to. So it's not just public storytelling in the form of theater, we also publish sto public storytelling in kind of drawing in the sand together, in this case with masking tape but, and toys. But it allows us to kind of change the way in which the, the dialogue happens and to really challenge the power dynamics that are at play here. Um, so these, this, is, this is the workshop we've just come from and I'm traveling, that's why I'm in my car, um, to, some, to visit some other researchers where we're doing some work on reflecting on this. Um, and yeah, and this is just kind of the overall work of the Coastal Justice Network and the One Ocean Hub. This is one area of it where we're really thinking about changing the, the um, participative decision-making process and participative uh, governance practices. And really, like I say, situating ourselves in service of ocean defenders as scholar activists and, and learning every day what that really means um, and taking on a lot of that labor that, that Dina has really beautifully articulated. So I'll leave it there, I went a bit over time.
Thank you so much for that presentation, Dylan, and for all of your presentations, Rebecca and Dina also. Um, so much to think about, and so many different perspectives to really take into account. So we're very excited to have, um, to have these presentations. We're gonna hear next from Uze, and then we'll hear from Elisa, who are the discussants for these, um, for these panelists. So Uze, whenever you're ready. And we do invite you to um, make comments or questions in the chat, um, and we'll, we'll um, try to make some time for that also. Uze? Um, yeah, thank you very much, um, Erin. Can you hear me, please? Yes, perfect. Oh, okay, oh, okay, yeah. Um, I'm very sorry for coming to the class a bit late. Um, I met the tail end of um, Rebecca's presentation, so I may not be able to make a lot of comments um, about hers. But I heard her talking about um, issues of a dirty plant, a plant, um, a power plant that causes health hazards, um, heat hazards and things like that. And the fact that the government in New York was making plans to replace these um, power plants with renewable energy sources um, and options in that, of that nature. But I would, I'm just interested in knowing what type of renewable energy options the government in New York is considering for that particular island or to replace those dirty power plants. Because, of course, as time uh, uh, progresses, we are beginning to find out that even some renewable energy options um, and the way they are deployed can lead to long term environmental ha hazards, um, some of which may even be worse, um, as some have ha argued, than um, fossil fuel plants, as the case may be. Yeah, so that's with respect to Rebecca's presentation. I don't know if she's going to respond before I go into Dina's. Um, Rebecca, if you'd like to, sure. Um, it, um, right now, it is um, the plan is for uh, solar panels, but the idea is that um, as the wind power um, market picks up, there'll be wind generating their, um, turbines there and um, possibly water turbines as well. But it's all uh, in the planning stages right now. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for your presentation, Dina, on public participation, injustice, and um, resistance, as the case were. Um, I think a lot of what you shared also um, bear certain levels of similarity with what happens in the Niger Delta region of Nigeria, where I am at the moment, where basically public participation with locals or indigenous peoples um, actually is actually used as a weapon against the people. Um, you have situations actually where um, the oil companies basically select as it were the leaders that they will speak to or they consult with. There's bribery in the process. There's exclusion of women and youth from the process. There's setting up of one community against another essentially. Um, and all manner of practices so as to get their end of establishing oil infrastructure um, that are not compatible with the well being or the living patterns of the locals in those particular communities. You know, and a lot of times people question the potency of public participation to deliver um, sustainable projects, as it were, because of the way a lot of the oil companies have compromised, rather, compromised the process of public participation together with uh, members of the community. A lot of these communities are actually very poor. So when these oil companies bring a lot of money to the community, they are able to have their way uh, to sharing of monies and just um, basically employing practices in the process of participation um, that will not really bring out the value of the benefit of public participation for sustainable um, development. But then um, I found this suggestion with respect to um, considering public participation uh, as resistance or considering resistance.
you've you've just been muted, Urs. Can you unmute? Okay. Um, Maybe repeat the last sentence. Okay. Can you hear me now, please? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So, but then I was just trying to wrap my head around um, the idea of considering resistance as uh, participation, especially um, violent or hot based um, resistance as part of public participation. I was wondering if it would not be better to consider it as a consequence of lack of a proper public participation um, system. And the reason why I think this way is uh, because I'm thinking about a situation um, or where we should prevent communities from employing resistance as a first port of call with respect to engaging with government and developers, um, but rather taking it as, okay, because we have not had a proper sit down and discussion on this point, so we are gonna act out in this particular uh, manner. Uh, because if we do not do that, then we have a situation where at every project proposal, the next thing you see is a protest, next thing you see it's violence and um, approaches like that and a lot of times depending on the society you're talking about the government and developers will be happy actually about such um, riots and um, forms of physical resistance because then they just have a reason to bring in the military as it happens frequently in the niger delta where you have a lot of militancy and community-based vigilante groups who go around blowing up oil pipelines that they disagreed with. And so you just have the entire region militarized and life being made uncomfortable for a lot of citizens. So I was just thinking about that dynamic, if it's not better to turn it around and say we are acting this way, we are resisting in this manner because we have not had the proper time. You have not given us the opportunity to air our views and to sit down with you to make a joint decision on this. If you give us that opportunity, there will be no resistance of this nature. Um, so, uh, so that's my first um, question or thought I'd like to have your comment on. And also with respect to the subtle limitations um, of public participation process, which are real, the fact that developers and government agents uh, may not speak the same language as indigenous people, um, the fact also that um, key concepts in the public participation um, system or in the discussions may have different meanings as between community people and the government people. These are things that, it, like you rightly said, is difficult for regulations to handle. So I'm just thinking right now if it's your view that the law has reached its end with respect to enabling adequate public participation? Is there something the law can, you think the law can do or should do in that context? Is there a way you think the law can assist in bridging that um, social cultural gap between indigenous people and government people? Because they will have to meet and talk about development in their country one way or the other. Um, because um, I'm also trying to avoid a situation where the discussion is pushed too far um, towards the side of uh, community people or indigenous people and the government and people and developers are left holding the short end of the stick because government individuals will tell you that um, provided in the laws is that they have a right to development, the right to develop their countries and then um, the indigenous will come out with their own perspective. So is there a way you think we can bridge this divide or this cultural, such cultural gap between government and indigenous people respect to participating and communicating um, so that they can make progress with respect to development? And do you think the law can help or this is a purely social affair? I have a few more questions, but I think because of time, I'll just let um, you handle this too. Thanks, thanks, Urs, and, and I hope you send me those more questions. We can keep talking. Okay. But um, I mean, in terms of resistance, so one of the things I'm sort of trying to do at the moment is sort of really think about and conceptualize like resistance and what it is. And and the first thing I'd say about it is that I don't only think about kind of um, 
protest or property destruction as resistance, although I do think those are resistance and I do think those are legitimate forms of participation, not reactions to failed participation, but participation. But I also think what, what Dylan described is, is a process of resistance. I think what Rebecca described is a process of resistance. And I see these as processes of resistance because it seems to me that what they're doing is they're resisting the kind of standardized and in many ways, um, uh, mutilized and distorted approaches to participation that have just become uh, kind of global. You know, we see them everywhere. These, these kind of, um, uh, gestures towards inclusion that are that are that are hollow at best, um, and so I think I think there are many ways, many kind of discursive and performative, silent ways of engaging in resistance. Um, all of which are resistance. All of which are community led, are, are created by those communities, and um, and all of which I think um, should be seen as participation. Um, and should be and should be and should be integrated into our understanding as part of participation. But I also think that violent resistance um, uh, is participation, and I and I agree with you uh, that it has been a it has become an excuse for for militarization of communities and environments. And it's become an excuse for imposing decisions on communities because they are seen to be, you can't, we, we can't talk to them. Um, yeah. So in South Africa, after 25 years of failing to deliver public sanitation to people failing to, to build toilets in impoverished communities, um, communities started throwing consultants out of their, out of their um, areas every time anyone came in and destroying whatever toilets were built. And, um, and I think that that's, that's legitimate and that's speech act and, and what we need to figure out is how to, um, is how to understand that and recognize that and integrate that into what we understand as inclusive decision making processes. How we do that is uh, the subject of my current thinking and research. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna leave that out there for now. Okay. To your second question about whether the law can bridge the gap. Um, so, so as you can see, I'm, I'm a little bit kind of hopeless and skeptical about the state of the law, um, but, but I do think it can. So one of the things that I think, uh, as I say in the talk that is overlooked is the role of audiences um, in undermining and in uh, creating situations in, in, um, in which consultation fails. So I argued before, even though there was a consultation process and the community was there and the consultants were there and notes were taken, um, that consultation in that case actually didn't happen because the community wasn't heard. They were, they were trying to say something and it was very clear from the way that that was taken on that they just weren't heard the, the way they were meant to be. And my argument is that's a failure of participation. No participation happened there. Um, and, and, and I think what we need to, um, Dylan referred to this fantastic thing that they're doing in their project sculpting, sculpting with ears. One of the things I think that we need to do um, and think about is, um, is shifting some of the labor involved in participation from the communities who undertake enormous financial and time burdens in order to participate again and again and again, shifting some of that labor onto the audiences. I think we need to create people who are capable, we need to create systems, we need to create processes, but also we need to create consultants, we need to train and, and, and ensure that consultants are able to hear. Um, and 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 I have lots of thoughts about how to do that, but but I'm going to stop there because I because I know we're going to hand over to um, to Elisa now. But I'd love to keep talking about this with you. Thank you. For your okay. Yeah. So I'll just thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I actually um, think that um, resistance as a form of participation is actually what has helped. Um, the Niger Delta a bit, um, if at all, to internationalize and draw attention to the plight of the region, um, actually. So whatever 
serious consideration is being given to the plight of the Niger Delta in Nigeria by the courts in Netherlands, in London, by UNEP and international organizations. I believe it's an offshoot of um, the protest, the campaigns that have gone on in Niger Delta as against um, trying to engage with the government more formally. So I think that's helped um, a lot and we can explore that a lot. Thank you very much, Erin. Thanks. Um, Dylan, do you want to say a few words about that or should we hear from Elisa next and then maybe Dylan can respond? Yeah, let's hear from Elisa next. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I'd like to pick up on the, on the question that Uzazo made because in my own research as well, I've come to the point of thinking, okay, how do we support as environmental and human rights lawyers the real possibility, the right to say no as part of consultation? And, and I think there are human rights arguments that we can use, but they only go so far. And so I've been wondering, and, and today through the presentations, really thinking about the role of lawyers and, and legal scholars in, in contributing to this. Um, and I think one point that Dina made in her presentation really resonate, which is, well, for one thing, we need to go beyond the law and really tap into other disciplines and approaches. And I think the arts maybe um, through the work I've done, well, done and heard secondhand from Dylan and colleagues has really given me a lot of hope and insight into how as lawyers, we can reimagine our work and contribute. Sorry, my cat is a bit unsettled just now to, um, to advance this. And, um, but also how we need to come back to the law with what we learn and then see about how we can, um, capture these new insights and approaches into the kind of mainstream regulatory system that creates the barriers. Um, and I think one, one thing I'd like to start with in the reflection, I think a point of connection and response between what Dina presented and, and Dylan presented is that, um, um, uh, Dylan, you know, Dina, you mentioned that, um, sorry, I have to, my cat has been eating a plant, so. <laughs> Okay, this is my worst cat zooming bombing experience ever. Sorry about that. Um, I think that, you know, when we think about participation and, and the silency point that you raised, I think that there's an even earlier point, which is not even seeing groups or individuals as relevant uh, into a particular conversation about development or conservation uh, and people being invisible. I think this is something I've learned from, from Dylan's research and colleagues and how we create that awareness and understanding and, and curiosity about the, this, for instance, spiritual connections between uh, not even just coastal indigenous groups, but maybe communities that are inland or have been displaced into uh, away from the coast and still maintain um, a spiritual and cultural connection with the deep seabed. It's just like so beyond uh, many of our imaginations. And yet, and, and that explains why we don't see people and communities as relevant. So how we can in addition to all that work on, on, on silencing, I think really looking into who's not even seen um, as relevant is, is a key element of that rethinking about our role. Um, and then I think, you know, really questioning, uh, as you've done in your work, Dina, how participation, we see it as the opportunity, as like the realization of a procedural right, and yet it's full of risks, full of burdens, and actually maybe um, often an opportunity for oppression. So how do we need to rethink that? And, and there was this point in your presentation, Dean, about how we can't expect the education element, first of all, to be done by communities, but second, to be done during the consultation. And so that's where what we've been exploring with Dylan is how can we use the amazing work, uh, empathy-theater and other art-based participatory methodologies to create the conditions for very different consultation down the line. How can we use that as a training tool for EIA consultants? How can we use that to develop the skills of government officials, uh, enforcement officials, and, and, and eventually business representatives to, to be better equipped to even engage and understand who their counterparts are, who the right holders that they have obligations and responsibility towards are, and how they need to uh, prepare before even entering into a conversation. And I think linked to that, I've always been wondering in, you know, in, in all the 
current thinking on business responsibility to respect human rights. There's this, well, both companies and governments have obligations to address the power imbalances. And in fact, these obligations extend to paying for uh, support to communities in engaging. And so what I'm thinking here is that we really have to rethink um, and, and work with governments and companies to fund that kind of research, like uh, Dylan's work and, and you know, civil society and others who are doing this, who are taking the burden off communities to educate um, third parties into engaging respectfully uh, and understanding uh, other worldviews um, and really other completely different stakes in particular decisions. So, so I'm, I am hopeful that um, for how much lawyers need to um, move away from a lot of things that we are taught often, definitely in my case, still in a very a critical way, even where we're really trying to push the boundaries through law, um, work more and more um, across disciplines and with the arts and learn how we can rethink our role, but then also develop new legal arguments to support and back up that work when we see that that's really game changing, uh, because at the end of the day, it will be going in and out of the law um, and not, I guess, abandoning the hope that um, the law can play a part, but not by itself and not without really deep self uh, criticism and, and reflection. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I think any comments back would be great to hear. Dylan, your thoughts to close out the program? <laughs> Um, yeah, this is so rich. I really like the Lisa bringing in the um, who's actually invisible and remains invisible during the consultation process. I mean, we're just backtracking now, researching just how much has gone on, on the, in this country and who ha was never even included or even thought to be someone who was a right holder to that, that development. So a lot of it is actually kind of <clears throat> almost um, historical restorative justice work around that. So recently that mapping workshop I just showed, we there'd been civil society projects working there for a long time, trying to get government to just realize that the these cooperatives along the coastline were stakeholders, but they weren't included in, in any of the processes. And so it took a lot of work and often like long calls on the, on the phone and um, late into the night with different officials and with, uh, leaders to try get those people in a room because that work just doesn't happen and the real tragedy is that what's considered legally suitable uh, for consultation is just so um, weak and insipid and so government officials can tick off that they've done participation quite happily and seemingly sleep happy at night because that's what the current law says is okay um, and so this this it's kind of deeply entrenched, this exclusion of people is deeply entrenched in the current, what's considered legal system. So that's um, very concerning and we're trying to raise more and more uh, awareness around that and, and really challenge that with a potential work towards a court case at the end of the Ocean Hub project. Um, the other thing I wanted to just quickly mention in response to the discussions now was the importance of language. And Dina, I can't remember what you, how you phrased it with, um, the kind of uh, hermeneutic comp competency across worldviews. I mean, we've been calling it like epistemic agility and trying to facilitate kind of an, an agileness for ourselves even, just between different worldviews and understandings. Um, there's, a, there's a need for us to become much more agile, uh, much more fluent in the languages of our country, uh, much more fluent in the idiomatic thinking and the ways in which meaning making is made and and this has to quickly like like tomorrow uh feed back into systems like international policy systems like unep and um into other spaces international government practices and i mean just in that one workshop we could suddenly see some high high level like two stages down from the minister who were, who was in that room having kind of being held accountable in a new way because someone rose, raised a, a question around tides that um, the official kind of scoffed at as kind of ignorant. And then the lashback from the community, from the community representatives, in this case, the traditional leaders and the cooperative leaders, quickly educating him on how problematic 
that was to even laugh at them at making, because for them, the tidal story is much more nuanced to how the scientists play it out to be. And he really ate his words and, and by the end of it apologized for just his ignorance in that space. So, um, but, but that conversation couldn't happen until we started the mapping work. It was, you know, two hours of like, like politicking and filibustery and like trying to just present PowerPoint presentation after PowerPoint presentation and talk at communities it was only once we had the floor and we could get everyone off, off their seats and actually look at what does this really mean for people and people could speak to it all in Isikosa that that kind of conversation and that dynamic and power play with officials could happen so yeah I suppose my, my point is that there's um a lot of work we need to do in a labor we need to work towards and I you know from what I understand of this summer school the people in the summer school are really um, at, in a position to kind of use your privilege and knowledge and become, in a way, scholar activists towards this kind of more uh, robust um, approaches to democratic decision making. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. This has been such an incredibly rich conversation. And as we can all see, there's so much more to be said and, and, um, and, and more food for thought. I just wanna say quickly, I just love the way that this whole conversation has really evolved into very, very deep questions about the scope of the law, what can the law do and how we, those of us who are interested in these issues need to really think creatively, very, very creatively about ways to shift the shape of the law and expand it and extend it so that it includes all the voices that need to be heard. So please join me in thanking our extraordinary panelists and discussants for leading us through these really, really important um, conversations. And I'd also like to thank um, all the participants for your wonderful comments and for staying with us and for um, being a part of this of this program. We're only halfway through this week. It's already been just such an extraordinary intellectual feast. So please join us in a few minutes, take a quick break, and then please join us again for the introduction to the Escazú Agreement, which is starting in just a few minutes. Tomorrow also is a very full day with programs on the marine environment that Elisa will be um, a part of, also programs on politics, democracy, and justice in, um, in energy transitions, human dignity and human rights, which has a lot sort of, of connections with what we've been talking about today, and rights for non-humans in the Anthropocene. So that's just tomorrow, and then there's more programs on Friday. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to, to be a part of this, and, um, and thanks very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.